and we are live. Welcome everyone uh, to uh, Readsy Live, Readsy's ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write and publish better books. My name is Martin, I'm from the team here at Readsy. I'm based in London, uh, but Readsy is everywhere. Uh, not that's relevant. Uh, anyway, I'm so glad you could join us today uh, for another First Line Frenzy. Long time viewers uh, will know this uh, sort of ongoing segment series that we have. Uh, where editor Rebecca Heyman comes in and uh, she reviews first lines submitted by you, the viewers, uh, and give uh, sort of feedback, actionable, honest advice. Uh, and uh, yeah, we all have a, a good old time. Uh, if anyone's brand new to this, don't worry, you'll get the hang of it. Uh, a few days ago, I sent out a newsletter to anyone who signed up to the Readsy newsletter. Uh, if you're not, do. Uh, and I invited them to submit uh, their first line, their first sentence of their book, short story, whatever. Uh, I've picked uh, a whole handful of them, uh, and we're going to review them with Becca in just a few minutes. Uh, let us see who is here. Tell us uh, where you're coming from today. And um, yeah, we have Laura Morgan from South Wales. Um, we have Lauren from uh, Toronto. So happy that First Line Frenzy is back. Wonderful. Uh, Julia says, evening, Martin. Glad to see everyone here. Uh, we have John Viral, uh, grew up in Missouri. Uh, we have Cassandra P from Houston. Uh, we have, uh, let's see who else, uh, da, 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 da. we have Rick Dyer from Birmingham, Alabama, different from Birmingham in the UK. Uh, we have A059Ron from Los Angeles, wonderful. Uh, we have Christy from the Oregon coast, glad to see everyone here. Uh, yeah, we're just going to start this thing in just a minute or two. Uh, but before we bring Becca on, if you uh, if you enjoy the First Time Frenzy series, do give this video a like and consider subscribing to our channel where we bring out new content every single week. Uh, yeah, like uh, the likes do help us, the subscribes certainly do help us. Uh, and yeah, we promise uh, all good content, no duds. But uh, we'll kick this thing off in just a few minutes. Uh, but if uh, anyone sort of turns up later and asks, uh, will the entry be featured today? Yet again, if you're a long-time viewer, you'll know that we do get a lot of submissions for first lines. And this one certainly is no exception. We've had about 2,000 entries. So I spent a good chunk uh, of today reading through, I assure you, the vast majority of them. Uh, and I've picked a good selection of uh, first lines that represent a whole different uh, a variety of genres and types and uh, ways of starting a book. So if yours isn't picked, please accept our apologies. Hopefully you will learn plenty of great stuff from this. If I do select it, it's not a competition. Uh, I didn't go through looking for purely the best or purely the worst. Uh, we're just trying to pick uh, a range of stuff just so Becky can have a look at it and react and everyone can learn and we'll all be very happy. Um, Emery said 2000, very impressive, yes. Uh, thank you for everyone's enthusiasm uh, sending your first lines in. Uh, I've tried my best to make sure that none of the ones featured have been featured before. I made that mistake last time. I'm pretty sure this time uh, I've avoided that, but if I haven't, I'm sure you'll let me know. I'm noticing now it is now one minute past the hour. Uh, that means it's time to start, so let's bring on my guest. Uh, Long-time viewers will know my guest as an editor, cat lover, and the owner of a white fence that looks like a snowy garden. She is the creator of First Line Frenzy, and one of Readsy's most sought-after professionals, please welcome Rebecca Heyman. Becca, how you doing? I'm great. That was quite an introduction. Thank you for considering our fence. Um, so it has it been snowing? No, it's torrentially raining outside, though. So if it gets loud or anything, I can try to put in my other headphone if you need me to. But it's uh, it's it's precipitating. It's a uh, it's one of those moody writing days where you just want to be curled up at home, and typing away. It's it's very aesthetic. Yes, for sure. But uh, anything beyond like actually engaging with the outdoors today is not, it's not for me. No. Well, uh, w what better time and environment to uh, just curl up at home and uh, tune into a live stream uh, and see Could some first more? lines. <laughs> it's a perfect day for first line frenzy. Yeah. So uh, for anyone who's brand new, Becca, what should folks expect from first line frenzy? What is it and what is it not? Okay. So welcome to the newbies. Uh, now that we've got you, we won't let go. You've been warned. First Line Frenzy is a community learning project for writers that I started, it's gotta be close to 10 years ago. Um, it started on Twitter with me just tweeting out uh, first lines from submissions I was reading for like a contest that I was an editor for and giving my feedback on those first lines. 
uh, First Line Frenzy is anonymous to keep our egos out of it. First Line Frenzy is sometimes funny, sometimes a little um, harsh. It's always honest. It comes from a place of compassion. It's supposed to be fun. Uh, and what is it not? It is not um, a platform for you to post your first line in the comments and just wait for people to stroke your ego. <laughs> it is not um, a place to bring like aggression or bad feelings. It's supposed to be a supportive learning environment and that's what we strive to make it. Great. Uh, in which case I've picked uh, dozens and dozens. We might not get through all of them, but we'll try our best. <laughs> We, won't exactly we definitely won't. It. Everybody adjust your expectations. Like just, I am only, I am but one woman. <laughs> so. All right. With that in mind, uh, can you hear me still? I Brilliant. can hear you. Oh, and we should tell everybody that I've never seen these lines before. So I am not like clued in in advance as to like what, what is going to come up here. So this is all sort of like a first impression. Okay. So this first one has been sent in by Ian. The door to the Rolling Coin Inn creaked as it closed behind Lint, the same creak as 97 years earlier, the last time it closed behind him. Um, you can reveal the genre to me. Is this, this is a fantasy? Correct. Is it YA fantasy? Uh, it has not been stated as such. Okay, because with a name like Lint, you know, the, Lint is like peak fantasy name because right. uh, as I mentioned in other first line frenzies, it is a noun that means something totally different. So of course it is used for a proper noun here. Um, so this line, I, I, I love the idea that we immediately know that Lint is coming back to a place where um, he has been previously. 97 years is a, is a long time to be away. Uh, so that's something to consider. I don't like how much language is used to say something that's fairly straightforward, right? Um, we talk about precious first line real estate. This is the only first line your book has. And so to spend that line on the sound of a door, and not just the sound it made one time, but the sound it made twice, is like kind of a wasted opportunity. So the sentence itself is not like offensively bad or anything. There's nothing wrong with it per se. Um, you've correctly hyphenated 97. So congratulations, you're part of a minority who manages to do that on the first try. But it just isn't that interesting. So I love when a character is returning to a place after a long absence. That's always, I'm always like sort of keen about that. I just don't think this gives us enough meat on the bone. And I would perhaps either find a different sensory input that's not like the creak of a door, maybe stay more focused on Lint's experience, not just of a sound, but his actual bodily experience of walking into this place um, or bring in other senses, like olfactory senses can be very powerful memory triggers, something like that. Or like maybe even tell me what Lint expected to see, be like, I don't know, or like what he does see compared to what he thought he was going to see. I just think there's probably something more interesting to say here than a door creaked. Cool. And uh, that was from Old Man on a Hill Fantasy. That's from Ian. Ian, thank you for sending that one in. First one Ian. in the books. This in the from books. Arkham. First the smiles, then the lies. It was the Vatican way. <sighs> no notes. <laughs> I love this one. Um, yeah, uh, you nailed it. I think this is great. Um, really nice use of a colon here. So a colon is used to introduce a complete sentence or a list. And in in this case, it kind of acts also like a, I always think of a colon as kind of like the, the sound, you know that like, <laughs> I can't do drum sounds, but like it's the sound that the drums make after a joke. Oh, you the know rim shot. Yes. And so it's kind of like, this is the punchline. It introduces the punchline. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm like, you know that drum sound. <laughs> uh, so I love the way that this introduces a punchline that just like cuts to the, to the heart of something really powerful. So I, I love this line. Good job. Yeah, it's a uh, Arkham from the Eighth Sacrament uh, Mystery Thriller Suspense. Yeah, it's classic sort of hard boiled stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, I just... The Eighth Sacrament is a great title, too. I like that. 
Uh, okay, this one I put in because uh, it brings up some classic First Line Frenzy uh, feedback and then a little bit more as well, I think. Uh, Is it dialogue or weather? Oh, it's waking up. <laughs> I woke up not knowing where I was, a sensation I wasn't exactly unfamiliar with. I just dropped into a short coma. Um, so first of all, this semicolon is used very, very incorrectly. A semicolon is used to connect two complete sentences that inform one another either by contrast or um, or by like collaboration. So either the meaning of one can't be understood without the other or the meaning of the second somehow crystallizes or clarifies the first because of its contrast. So a sensation I wasn't exactly unfamiliar with is not a complete sentence and therefore this semicolon is invalid. Um, waking up in a first line is a super duper cliche and we don't do that here. Um, I would I would venture to say it's the number one, like it's the cardinal first line frenzy don't, right? We, we had, well, had an unusual amount of waking up whether it's being woken up uh, on a flight, if it's woken up uh, by the weather. It's, it was more waking up here than before. So I hope those are, wow. are newcomers, of which, of which okay. you're, you're allowed a pass this one time. But to clarify, waking up from a coma, still waking up. Waking up um, like in a bathtub filled with ice, still waking up. Waking up after a hundred bajillion years, still waking up. None, none of it is an exception to the rule. Be be more creative, find another entry point. Um, the only way to make a wake up line worse is if a character wakes up and immediately describes themselves by looking in a mirror. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, no one cares about this. Just doesn't matter. Cool. Well, thank you, Kirk. Uh, yeah, I hope you Sorry, Kirk. from this one. <laughs> thank you for sending that Try again. From the adventures of Argon Bosch, uh, a science fiction piece. Uh, here is one from a memoir. Confusion ran through us like a contagion that night. Oh, I like that. Oh, I really like that. I don't know if ran through is the correct verb phrase. Spread amongst because, them. Yeah, like I would say maybe confusion spread through us like a contagion because a contagion doesn't run. So I would just be like extremely precise with your verb choices always. This is a blanket statement for everybody. Um, powerful specific verbs can make a huge difference in your prose all of the energy that you put into selecting the perfect adjective should be rerouted to selecting the most perfect pristine verb in every uh, sentence and it will just drastically improve the strength and clarity of your writing uh, so this is close it's really close nice but it's not quite there uh that's from Alex, a memoir called Smoke and Dust. Thank you for sending that one in, Alex. Uh, this one, this next one is, oh yeah, I'll, I'll let you guess what it's from. Oh no. On her first day at Pear Tree Public School, Jill Partridge, secret agent, met a man holding a zucchini and dressed in a black and yellow uniform that made him look like a bumblebee. Is it middle grade? Oh, it's, it says children, so it could be middle grade. Yeah, so it's probably middle grade, um, which is like a very vast, like there are so many ages within middle grade, right? Uh, okay, so we need a comma after school because introductory phrases of four or more words receive a comma at the end, thank you. Jill Partridge, secret agent, that's correct, right? That's a modifying phrase, secret agent, it's modifying Jill Partridge, and so that gets offset by commas because it's parenthetical. Met a man holding a zucchini and dressed. So this is a, a verb, um, parallelism problem. So she she met a man holding a zucchini. Uh, met is simple past tense, but holding is a progressive verb, right? Like ing means it's an ongoing thing. He's holding the zucchini in an ongoing fashion. And so we can't then revert back to dressed uh, for that same man because we have a parallelism problem where we want our verbs, uh, verbs in a single phrase have to match. So met a man dressed in black in a black and yellow uniform that made him look like a bumblebee i i may i might even save the zucchini for line two i'm just not sure you can fit it in uh reasonably with all of the other stuff and the other stuff is important especially in a middle grade novel 
So I would say let's get rid of holding a zucchini and and see what that looks like. Can we do that through the magic of television? We sure can. Is black and yellow hyphenated? No, um, it's not. It's not hyphenated. So the, the uniform is black and yellow, and I understand that that does function as an adjective phrase, but it's not like a black and yellow striped. If, mm -hmm. if it was a black and yellow striped uniform, uh, which it may be, right, if he looks like a bumblebee, but unless we articulate the word striped, then we do not need to hyphenate these words. Cool. Uh, I think was... it's good. I think it's good for a middle grade novel. We have a character. We have something interesting happening. You've established the setting really quickly. Um, there's like also this idea that it's her first day at the school, I think is a great little ad. So we know that it, you know, she's there for the first time. I think there's something appealing about that as well. Um, maybe the second sentence is even he was holding a zucchini. You know, like I just think that one little piece was just a little bit too much. But I think this is a nicely engaging sentence for a young reader, for sure. Cool. Uh, thank you for sending that one in, Bill. Uh, from Yeah, this is definitely a very middle grade title. Jill Partridge and the Invasion from the Hockey Stick Galaxy. Sounds perfect. My, yes, my young readers at home would probably enjoy that very much. <laughs> All right, this next one here is from Aza. Uh, On 55 Boulevard lives a family of five. It's a fact cake! <laughs> so a uh, fact cake, for those of you who don't know, is another first line frenzy term. Um, it is based off of an anecdote that a friend told me about her uh, sister-in-law who got married and her wife-to-be uh, presented her with a cake at their rehearsal dinner that said, tomorrow you will be my wife. Very fact-based fact cake. And it's just like, yeah, that was kind of undisputable, right? Like, it's just like aggressively factual. And so this is what we have here. There's no no character, like we know a family of five like exists on 55 Boulevard, but we, we haven't met any of them. So we can't really say there's a character here. There's no conflict, there's no character, there's no setting, they're, they're just, it's just a street where people live and that's not, uh, that's not terribly thrilling. So I'm gonna say this is the wrong entry point for this, unless it's like a family of five ghosts or <laughs> like, it's a family of five and four of them were unconscious. I don't know. You have to maybe add to this a little bit um, so that we feel engaged. Cause right now I just feel like a passing sense of, oh, okay. All right, that was the Aza from uh, a, a piece of general fiction. Sorry, it's sort of the generic um, other category we have uh, titled Gildial and the Funny War. Uh, okay. This next one, uh, well, if you wanted something with character, setting, and conflict, uh, this one certainly has it, uh, from Ash. Victor studied the wooden doors of the council building towering before him, contemplating whether to turn around and leave before it was too late. So a couple things here. Council is, uh, is you've, you've misidentified the homonym here. Um, so if it's the counseling building, then this is the correct spelling. But if it's a council building, like where a council meets, that's C-O-U-N-C-I-L, right. Um, so what we have here is someone standing still in front of a building thinking private thoughts. And that is also not very interesting. We call this in our little uh, first line frenzy lexicon, starting with a stop. So again, you're just bringing this in like a couple of minutes too soon I don't, like, I will never be interested in someone just standing still looking at a building. I mean, honestly, like, really, would you? Would you be interested in that? I don't, it's just not great. So I, I don't love characters just standing still or sitting still and thinking. We see this a lot. It's, it's throat clearing, right? Like, it's a way for you to get your story started without actually making anything happen. And... Uh, it's kind of a way to rip off the band-aid, like as you're writing, but this is the kind of thing that should be stripped out when you edit. Yeah, so I guess what you would have Victor start 
a few minutes later where he's already in the council building in the midst of it, regressing having come in. Regretting having come in or like, uh, what did he know was going to happen? Or like, what did he think was going to happen that didn't happen? And then something worse happens, you know, like I just, it, it's not, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not interesting to just be like, Hmm, cause we, like, we know you're going in. Otherwise, why would you have started the book here? So like everybody kind of secretly already knows what's going to happen. And that's, that's not fun. Hmm. I already guessed the endings of like 98% of media I consume. <laughs> it's an occupational hazard. And uh, like, don't, don't set me up to do it immediately in line one. That's boring. <laughs> so. Unless you subvert it. Like he stands there wondering whether he should go in. Cut to, he's back at home sleeping. The end, you know, <laughs> it's like, I just saw a reel the other day about how like, if, um, if Harry Potter's parents had just made each other their secret keepers, then the whole book, like nothing bad would have happened ever. <laughs> and, like, it just would have been so easy. And like, it's kind of like that, right? Like we know you're going in. So just phew, get in there. Tell us what All happens right. next. Thank you, Ash, for sending that one in from The Demon's Witch, uh, a fantasy book. Uh, oh my God. Okay. So like, not for nothing. It's called The Demon's Witch. And then you hit me with this clunker. You've drawn me in with the title. And then you have, you've just, it's like a, uh, what do they call them when you're like a bait, a bait and switch. switch? Yes, a bait and switch. I am like not linguistically super <laughs> adept today, which is kind of poor timing on my part. But uh, we had a next one, and I know we. Know, I don't think we've ever had swears on First Line Frenzy, at least not on oh, read. Shit. So. Okay. <laughs> Language, a language alert if you are, I guess, under 18 or of. All right, clutch your pearls, everyone. Let's see what we got. A gentle disposition. <laughs> This is bullshit, Jim whined, as he took another sip from his fifth cup of the weakest coffee he ever tasted. Whew! I'll tell you what's bullshit, that comma outside the quotation marks. You just pop that baby right in. Um, commas belong inside quotation marks, my friends. Thank you. I, as a, I don't know if it's because I am a mother and thus have developed an allergy to whining, but any character who whines is almost immediately someone I don't like. So that is a, a totally biased opinion on that very specific verb, right? I asked for very specific verbs and you gave me one and now I hate it. But whining, especially when adults whine, makes me like heave a little bit. I hate adults who whine. Um, Jim whined as he took another sip from his fifth cup of the weakest coffee he'd ever tasted. He had ever tasted he'd would be more appropriate there. So like I generally discourage starting with dialogue. And the reason is because dialogue is inherently without context. When you hit us with a line built from narration, right? The prose that is not dialogue. You have an opportunity to provide us with context. Things like, um, you know, uh, setting or, um, like contrast, you can tease out metaphors and things like that. You you can have a little bit more um, room to move as an author and as like a word artisan when you don't start with dialogue. So when you start with dialogue, you're really limiting the context you can provide to your readers in a given moment. And ultimately, I, I tend not to be very moved by first line dialogue. I think it's often confusing. It's disorienting. Um, and this is like an unlikable bit of dialogue. Some, uh, some people are like super turned off by like foul language in general. It doesn't bother me, but I, I don't, I just think it sets a tone that you might not be able to shake off. Um, and it may turn some readers away before they've had a chance to really engage with your story. Oh, we've got a, uh, a good comment here. Just wait. Uh, let me see if I can get uh, great comment here. Uh, Yosef uh, Miyasato says, oh, wine. he saved the cat so pathetically that it made me lose all respect for him. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yes, like 100%. I also want to note for the record that like since we started this broadcast, the sun has come out. And so I think like just the vibes, the first line frenzy vibes must be good. I don't look at the comments during a live because it'll give me a heart attack, but whatever you're doing over there in the comments, I think is very positive and has improved the weather in my area. So thanks everyone. 
sending all the good vibes. But you know, yeah. this is weather is a zero sum game. So it's right now, somewhere is getting some real terrible weather. Uh, yes, but it's not me. And so <laughs> I'm pleased. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richard, for sending that one in. The Fall Guy, an action adventure. Perhaps the lead character is a is a, a real whiny person. Um, okay, this one, yeah. Monserrate. Uh, here we go. There, is, this, is this it? You want this me to read it? it? Okay. Yeah. As much as Maria loved horses, she had an equal amount of disdain for horse people. Um, <laughs> it's funny if you think about horse people as a people horse hybrid, and it is, which of course would require a hyphen, so that's not what it means, but it just made me giggle for a second. And it's also funny if you know horse people, which I do, because I grew up as an equestrian and horse people are sometimes the absolute worst. <laughs> so um, I, I don't dislike this. I'm not ready to say that I like it yet, but I don't dislike it and here's why. Maria is giving us an opportunity to like, sit with her at lunch you know like she's like okay if you also don't like horse people but like horses you can sit here and i like that it kind of puts us in like a, a you know two-person club right away um and i like that maria is positioning herself as an animal lover and not necessarily a people lover that also like speaks to me really personally it's just like super relatable so yeah, I, I like this. I like this line. I like cool. it. Uh, that's from Brianna, a mystery thriller suspense book called "If Horses Could Talk." I mean, awesome! I loved everything about that submission. Good job. Cool. Uh, I got the the entry for this one wrong. This one's from Montserrat. Uh, oh. Here we go. Okay. The kid sitting next to me didn't look old enough to be at the bar and definitely not old enough to have a Nazar X50 amplifier jacked into his skull. Is it sci-fi? Am yes. I supposed to know what that is? No. Okay. Okay. I don't think you're that like, out of touch. There's like, I don't know, because these days have the stuff jacked into their skulls. Becca, have look, you been Honestly, up? like, I, eventually that will happen and I will miss it. To be honest, we're, we're getting a hurricane up by me this weekend. And my mom, who lives in Florida, told me about it. And she was like, well, your hurricane is coming. And I was like, the what now? So yeah. I'm like profoundly out of touch. Um, so anyway, the kid sitting next to me didn't look old enough to be at the bar. So I don't love this repetition on and definitely not old enough. I just think we could be more efficient. Um, the kid sitting next to me didn't look old enough to be at the bar let alone have a Nazar X50 amplifier jacked into his skull. I think I would just tighten it up to make it more tonally consistent. That M dash feels sort of languorous, like a, like a broad gesture, but uh, this feels like a more like snappy scenario and sentence and tone. So I think that's the only change I would make just thin out to this repetition, which is not really serving a, a good purpose. Cool. Uh, thank you, Monserrat, for sending that one in from Pelorian, a science Pelorian. fiction book. Uh, here's our next one coming right up, uh, sent in by Charlie. Charlie, I carry my grandfather's name, and on the day of his funeral, I carry his coffin too. <gasps> Ooh. I just don't know if that second carry should be present tense or past. Unless we're, this is like, if the whole thing is present tense, is this YA? Uh, well, it's general fiction, so hard to tell. Mm, so probably adult. Um, so in YA, we expect to see first person present tense. It's the most, that is the genre where we are most often going to see those uh, POV choices. Unless this is the day of the funeral, it should be, and on the day of his funeral, I carried his coffin too. But since we can't know, I I love this one. I'm going to say this is a gold star for me. Oh, first gold star of the day, Charlie Price, uh, The Watch. Well done. Uh, should we go on to the next one? Yeah. I mean, let's uh, move it along. This one is from David. A realtor's for sale sign hung forlornly outside the house. My house. Oh, boy. Okay. So like the capitalization on realtor, I don't know why we would do that. 
we wouldn't capitalize doctor, like if we were just talking about a doctor. Um, now, I know that realtors are, I'm just thinking like, I know realtors capitalize realtor. <laughs> like, I know. I guess it's their, yeah. is it their, maybe it's their title? This is, uh, it, this is it realtor is. Right, exactly. So like, I just, I know that in the past I have seen realtor capitalized where I don't think it should be capitalized. So I think you have to go with like the conventional wisdom on capitalization and not cap it. But I understand why you made this mistake and I forgive you. A realtor's for sale sign. Also, you don't need to put um, sign text in quotations. Uh, it can just be a realtor's for sale sign and you capitalize for sale, but you don't need the single quotes around it. Someone Hung also for pointed lonely. out that real, like what other sort of for sale sign is there? Yeah, I guess, like, I guess it could be like for sale by owner, right? Like that, I guess is the option. Oh, no, no, not fully in caps. Just Ooh. cap it how it was. Oh, okay. We don't need to scream at the folks about it being for sale. Um, hung forlornly outside the house my house so like the sign cannot experience like forlornness <laughs> and i understand what you're saying like i get it we're trying to like paint this sort of like sad picture but i think the sign is really excuse my pun taking up a lot of the real estate here <laughs> sorry guys. okay well, just wait um, just wait just hold while the laughter dies down at home <laughs> I'll wait, you guys. It's fine. It's fine. Um, my next career will definitely be in stand up. So uh, the thing is, you're giving us the subject, my house, my, me, you, the subject, uh, and you've relegated yourself like behind the sign and the signs, like emotional journey and the house and like who put the sign up. But then y'all are just like sticking yourself at the end, which seems very silly. So I would rather have the the true subject of the sentence take a take a, a, a more primary role. For example, um, like no matter how long I um, like no matter how long I stared like tried to direct my eye lasers at the for sale sign outside it wouldn't it wouldn't so much as budge or something like that you know like give me an experience from a character instead of focusing so much on this like sign and who hung it and all this other stuff and then just relegating the character to the very end the character is who is important here not the sign cool uh that one's from uh Da, 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 David from the House Time Forgot, a romance. Oh, I really like that title, David. Good job. Uh, all right. This next one is from Diane. Wait, uh, do you think everyone has finished laughing yet? Should we wait? I think, like, at least <laughs> half the people are probably calling their friends to share the joke. So they'll probably miss the next few of these. Um, but... That's okay. The, the replay will be up really soon, guys. It's all right. <laughs> Just tune back in when you're ready. Becca, we can clip this for social media. We can make it go live. <laughs> Okay. Uh, this next one's from a memoir from Diane. Although the street is quiet, there are soft murmurings as families gather on the porches for evening family time. So like that is a nice sort of like picturesque notion and that's a nice setting. But in a memoir, I want you to start with you because you're the big ticket item here, not like the neighborhood zeitgeist. So I would find a way to maybe contrast this person's individual experience in this moment against the broader, very like wholesome family environment around them. So maybe if it's like, um, maybe this person is anxious that the yelling inside their house will be audible you know, as people gather, like with this like sort of soft, soft susurrus of sound, you know, as people gather on the porches and they're afraid that like the yelling is what's going to pierce the night air or something like that. So I, I want a contextualized experience of this moment instead of you just telling me that this is what's happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, put, 
like a family is to sort of repeat twice. Oh, repeat what? Well, repeat just the ones. Well, families and family time. Yeah. Uh, that was from Diane uh, from the Mulberry Tree on St. Philip Street in Charleston, South Carolina. Memoir. Oh, maybe she's sitting in the tree. Uh, ooh, here's the next one uh, from Donna. Here Donna. we go. What'd you give me? I have heard tales of my madness. Girl, same. Um, super relatable. We love that. But it is a little bit of a fact cake. Like, I would maybe take it a little further. Like, um, maybe mention, like, the most common tale of my madness involves X, Y, and Z. Or, like, my favorite... The, um, the latest tale of my madness involves, you know, whatever it involves. I would just take it further. I, I think it's a great concept, but I would make it more engaging faster so that your reader has something to connect with. And it would set up a nice contrast if it was like, the latest tale of my madness is about, I'm not saying this in an especially narrative way, but like, let's say it's about you know, me streaking naked through the backyard under the full moon, whatever. And then like the second sentence could start to set the record straight in like a really funny way. Like actually what happened was, and then a reason for why everyone thinks this person is mad, but whatever they were doing actually made a lot of sense, you know? So I, I think by digging in a little more here and giving us an example of this supposed madness, you're more likely to garner sympathy between your reader and your character very quickly. And we want that. That's a good thing. Thank you, Donna. That was uh, from a piece of historical fiction called The Last Magdalene. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, uh, next one I've got coming up comes from Elizabeth. Sweat dotted Richard Fowler's brow as he ducked his brother's sword. Um, I like we don't need the surname here. Like it just doesn't matter. Bit of a fact cake. Like Richard exerted, Richard sweated, Richard ducked. Um, one assumes they're like fencing for practice and not locked in battle i don't know what's the genre here uh action adventure uh but the title is the greater swordsman so uh, i imagine you might be right yeah so again like i just make it more interesting like maybe don't reveal that he's uh like engaging with his brother right away and so we won't be so obvious that this is a practice session something like um uh like richard had like richard's opponent had lured him into um you know i don't know sword fighty words you know <laughs> but like richard's opponent uh had lured him into exposing his right side and uh time slowed as the consequences slashed toward his ribs right mm. like okay yeah. And then uh, and then you can reveal it eventually that it's his brother. You just you 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 take what the reason I think we're not I'm not responding well to the sentence is because it takes any idea of high stakes and just wipes them out by revealing it's his brother. And like the most extreme thing happening here is like a little bit of sweat just dotting his brow, you know? So like I don't I don't think the sword fight can be like much of a big deal if like the worst, the most intense thing you can tell us is that it causes a little bit of beaded perspiration. Yeah, the perspiration isn't exactly flying off his brow. It's just like, eh, just lightly dotted. He's glistening. <laughs> Please, my handkerchief. Start dabbing, <laughs> Start dabbing Jeez, into his forehead. My cool girl. So, yeah, you know, uh, I think thank it you, be better. Elizabeth, for sending that one in. The Greater Swordsman. Uh, this next one uh, comes from Shay. Reminder, Winnie the Pooh lived alone, walked around half naked, eating honey from a jar, and no one ever felt sorry for it. Did you just it, Winnie the Pooh? Yeah, no. Like, I guess Winnie the Pooh is technically inanimate. 
I'm going to, I'm going to pretend you didn't say that so we can stay friends. Um, but I'm also someone who wants to see like appropriately gendered pronouns for your animals. So like, I'm never going to be on team it, but Winnie the Pooh is, is a male bear. Like I, guys, come on. <laughs> Am I the only one who gets that? Okay. No, wait. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll show Winnie the Pooh the right amount of reverence. A big H. <laughs> Our Lord and Savior, Winnie <laughs> the Pooh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So a uh, reminder should have a colon after it instead of the M dash. It's kind of like that, but I'm chain thing that I was telling you about how like the colon introduces a punchline. And in a lot of ways, this is that. So reminder, Winnie the Pooh lived alone, walked around half naked as hyphenated um, and needs a comma after. So hyphenate half naked and then a comma after naked eating honey from a jar and no one ever felt sorry for him. I mean, yeah, like he led a charmed life. I'm not sure. Were we supposed to feel sorry for him? I feel like this will ultimately lead us. I think the character will be revealed as some kind of half naked, lonely person eating ice cream straight from the carton, which again, I think is fine. I mean, I just, Maybe there's just not enough judgment in my heart, but I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. Um, I think this is a good sentence. It's funny. It's interesting. I'd keep reading. Um, just don't call Winnie the Pooh an it. Yes. So Winnie the Pooh I, I, is, I was going to say, I believe it is hyphenated. Yeah. Um, but is it always hyphenated or is it one of those things where like Moby Dick is hyphenated sometimes, but not all the time? I can't look it up right now, but someone... Um, can a viewer look it up? I don't know. I think it's always hyphenated. I want to say yes. I think whenever he's called Winnie the Pooh, it's always hyphenated. Yeah. Right. If he's called mm. Pooh Bear, it's not, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Nobody ever calls okay. him Winnie. All right. I think I'm happy with that. I, I actually just realized that the narrator here is probably talking about walking around topless. I was imagining that she was walking around Winnie the no, Pooh. No, style, no, no. Like bottomless. Top off, just bottomless. Bottomless. Yes. That's why I think it's probably, hopefully, someone alone in their apartment or house. Yeah, they lived alone. Uh, this is from a romance called Good Luck Lou uh, from Shay. Thank you very much for yeah. sending that That one. feels yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the next one. Uh, do you need to take a, a sip of anything, uh, a little break, or are we good to go? Why? Is, am I going to, like, is it a spit take? Is it funny? No, no, no. no. You've never no. asked me that before. I know, I, I just realized sometimes we blast through so many of these that we don't really give you enough time to adequately hydrate on, on such a <laughs> range. Uh, but this one is from Galen. The day Alex Bryson's wife disappeared, she was shopping for maternity clothes. Okay, so we are characterizing a missing woman as someone's wife and as someone's soon to be mother. But she lacks agency, and now she's gone. So I am like a little, it rankles a little bit that like we have to so carefully contextualize this woman as someone's wife and then mention the maternity clothes thing. So like, it's not really something you shop for for other people. So we have to assume that she herself is expecting. And it's just, it is like, um, we're being like beat over the head by the idea of this person's um, conformity to certain societal expectations of femininity. And so that bothers me on like a personal, like it just kind of gets me. Uh, I also don't really know who this line is supposed to be about. Is it supposed to be about Alex or is it supposed to be about his wife? Because if it's about his wife, I'm not sure why she doesn't get her own name. She's just someone's wife and someone soon to be mother. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I think anyone like even mildly with like mildly feminist leanings will see that that is a flawed sentence for that reason. In this year of the Barbie movie, 2023, I just feel like we can do a little better by the women in our books, even if they are going to disappear. 
which like a lot of them do. So. Cool. Thank you, though. Galen Standing William, Finding Pia, Mystery Through the Suspense. Oh, like, maybe her name is Pia. Is and Pia. like, we could have maybe mentioned that in line one. <laughs> Uh, okay, our next one is from H. A. May. Uh, Ooh, H. A. May. I like that. Uh, here we <laughs> go. Uh, ooh, I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna correct a little bit of their punctuation for them because I may have accidentally let that off. Oh, That's okay. It. Hey, watch what you're doing there. My mare bespeaks me, jolting me until I have to spread my wings to regain balance. What? <laughs> What did I just read? Oh, it's, a fan <laughs> it's fantasy. I'll tell you that for nothing. Uh, uh, bespeaks me? Uh, but no. <laughs> We're not doing that. No, no thank you. Um, this again is starting with dialogue, which I think I've already covered, is not my favorite thing. The idea that, that bespeaks is the verb of choice here is... Uh, if I were an easily upset person, I would say it's upsetting. You know, it's just not I'm like, what is happening here? Jolting me until I have to spread my wings to regain balance. I mean, look, we love a Pegasus. Don't get me wrong. I assume that's what this thing is, right? Well, I spread my wings. So I'm imagining right. someone's riding a mare and they have wings and decides to ride the horse nonetheless. <laughs> Okay, why, why do you have to ride a horse if you have wings? You are already a mode of transportation. I mean, I guess you could say, why would you have to ride a horse if you have legs? But like, you know, I, I consider wings and like four legs sort of like on par in terms of speed and efficiency. This is very confusing. It's not for me, I'm gonna say. Uh, and like also like the, the horse is talking but the action belongs to the rider and that's also very confusing that's like smushing two um two totally separate ideas into a single line which is not really working for you here either i, I just the bespeak i'm never gonna get over it like never in a hundred thousand years because uh what was it uh, steph here says i don't know bespeaks is common in fantasy Le Guin was using it in the 70s like do some people is it a way of just doing like archaic talk like if Look, you want to I love fantasy past. and I read a lot of fantasy and I haven't encountered bespeaks uh, in a good long time, like maybe ever. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to say no. Also, like unless you're Le Guin, you know, just like follow the other normal person rules. You know, we can't all be like when you reach those upper echelons, you want to use bespeaks. That's fine. That's not a way to like capture any hearts in line one. You know what I'm saying? That's just. It's a no for me. Okay. Uh, I am but one woman, but for this woman, it is a no. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for sending that one in, uh, for besending that one in, HMA. <laughs> Besend. I love it. Okay. That was good. That was really punny. Oh, God. No, uh, are we just being a little bit catty today? Anyway, we'll, we'll fix no, it. No, that was funny. I, I mean, that's, come on. Like, that was funny. Guys. Okay. This one's from James. Um, if I can catch Rick Stackhouse without getting shot, I'll be able to get some extra LSAT studying in tonight. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I love that. Um, it's giving Buffy the Vampire Slayer vibes, but like Are human. You, the title is, you're as crazy on the nose what the title of this book is. Do you want to know what it is now? Yes. Oh my God, tell me. It's called Kiki Diamond Bounty Hunter. Shut the front door. I was so close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the title. I was like a huge, I mean, I'm still a huge Buffy fan, but like I haven't watched a show in a really long time, but that was like my, it was on 8 p.m. Wednesday nights on the WB when I was growing up and I, that was like, I was on the couch at like 7.55 ready to go. So I love that. I love the, that we get, um, we're learning about this main character um, without being told anything super blatant. Like it's not, Again, it's not like waking up and describing yourself in a mirror. It's letting us know, studying for the LSAT. So we're going to like kind of approximate this person's age. We know that there's some kind of like vigilante or obviously bounty hunter. We would have gotten that from the title. I, I love this. I think it's perfect. Cool. And uh, that's from 
uh, James Moore, who's actually here watching. Hey, James. Hi, thanks for being here. I love your line. Good job. Uh, okay, this one is from Simon. Oh, this may sort of, yeah. Hey, I'll, 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 I'll not comment. <laughs> okay. Her lone petite figure strolled along the side of the desolate road, shark-faced hood of the oversized streetwear pulled in tight over her Asian features. Christ on a cracker. Okay. Whew, where shall we begin? I mean, there's a smorgasbord of things to say. Um, we don't, we're not going to say things like Asian features as if all of Asia is just one monolithic culture with no variation. We're not going to do that, folks. We're not doing that. Um, also, her lone petite figure didn't stroll. She did. She is a human person, maybe, or, or whatever strolling thing. <laughs> is it fantasy? Just tell me now. Like, <laughs> can I use the word person? Like, whoever this person is, it's not their figure that strolled. It's them. So, like, you're you're automatically separating this, you know, female figure into her smallness and her shape. And so you're objectifying this character instantaneously. Strode along the side of the desolate road, shark-faced hood. What does that mean? Shark face should be hyphenated, no matter what it means. Shark-faced hood. Oh, I think it's a does thing that you literally get mean that there's like... Yeah, it's like a teeth? big hoodie you can get that looks like you're sort of a stuffed shark, I think. Is that a thing for the youths today? I, I've seen I'm, it. I've been served on TikTok. Oh, I'm not on the Tiki Tac. Mm -hmm. I don't. I just watch the TikToks that migrate slowly to reels. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> um, okay, so shark faced hood of the oversized streetwear. Why is it a streetwear and not a, and not a sweatshirt? What is streetwear? Like what? What? I think it's, I think it's just the oversized hoodie. So we could probably cut that yeah. down to shark faced hoodie. Yeah. Oversized yeah. shark faced hoodie. Shark, oversized shark faced hoodie pulled tight. Over, I, I will never get over the like, just <laughs> like, I just like be less racist. I don't know. It's, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not. It's, Come on. Oh uh, yeah, like, you can sort of see what you're going for, but you wouldn't write like uh, she entered the she entered the room Caucasianly. <laughs> right. Like, has anyone ever described me and been like? Her whitey whiteness was super pasty and pale, and she glowed in the dark as she walked on the desolate road. Uh, the answer is no. No one ever has and probably won't. So, like, come on. Give me a break. Maybe this person's features are delicate or sallow or, like, gaunt if they're, like, malnourished. There are many other ways to describe a person that have nothing to do with their, like, freaking continent of origin. You're not even getting down to the country level you're just like somewhere somewhere over there over there that's not here they're from there like give me a break please all right thank you very much though for sending that one in it's from desert dirt thank you simon uh okay. this next one is from jen one look at the family budget told Connie Morano she'd have to step up the breaking and entering this month yes Connie provide for that family sweetheart I love it it's perfect. We've got a lot of winners in this crowd. You picked really nicely for me. This is wonderful. And so some people always say, someone in the comments will always be like, I wish she'd tell us why she likes the one she likes. Uh, why do I like it? I like the fact that it is grammatically consistent and perfect. I like that it invites us into Connie's existence and her experience of the world in a really unique way. And I like that the tone is consistent with the content. That is why I like it. Good job, author. I have some questions about like breaking and entering. I guess it's like a known phrase, but I guess you don't have to sort of style it in any specific way. What do you mean? I don't know. You definitely wouldn't hy like hyphenate it. No, you no, no, no. You have to step up the breaking and entering this month. Because I guess some no, people have No, it's the way it is. Yeah. All right. Perfect. If no you notes. chose to... B and E, B and E, you would obviously make B and E capped, but you would just use an ampersand between them. All right, thank you. Uh, that's from Jen. Uh, uh, something's crooked about this house. Great. 
great title. I like that. Uh, and then this next one is from Jim, also within the general fiction catch-all. The waxing gibbous moon is fat, bulged, and swollen in the midnight, hanging too low to the southeast, like a bag of birth waters ready to break. Oh, God. <laughs> that was visceral. All right. little little PTSD there for me. Thanks. Thanks, friend. Um, like fat bulged and swollen. I just feel like these synonyms, we don't need all three. In the midnight is awkward for me. Midnight is a specific time. It's not, it's not a, like an expanse that one can be in, <laughs> right? Like I don't, yeah. that seems a little, um, not my fave. Hanging too low to the southeast when uh, our cardinal directions are not capitalized. So there's no reason, no reason to um, capitalize that unless you're talking about the southeast region of a specific place. And then you might capitalize it in certain instances, but not all instances. It's a very boring topic. Like a bag of birth waters ready to break. I mean, great image because it's so visceral and specific, but also gives me the willies. So I guess that's nice. Let's get rid of one of these synonyms. Um, how about the waxing gibbous moon is swollen, comma, hanging too low to the, and maybe it, the waxing gibbous moon is swollen and hanging too low to the southeast, M dash, like a bag of birth waters ready to break. That I, I like better. Even like an eliminate like, get rid of that. Yeah, obviously the software here doesn't allow us to make a nice long luscious M dash, but that's what we would use. I'm sorry, let me try it. Wait, there we go. Yeah, they are. Mm. Doesn't that feel so nice? It sure does. Yeah, this is actually a good line. It's super uh, evocative and weird. So as long as that's what you were going for, this is good now. Now it's good. Cool. That's from Full Star, a uh, picture book from Jim Landry. I'm sorry, a picture uh, book? Just kidding. It's general fiction. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got me. You got me real good. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh our next, God. We're just having a good old time today. All right. This next one uh, is from Kaylee. Uh, we can try squeezing just a few more before the end of the hour. Okay. Wrap it. It's the speed round. However many muscles it takes to smile, I must be using the bare minimum of them while talking to this girl. Um, get rid of of them, because we don't need it. However many muscles it takes to smile, I must be using the bare minimum while talking to this girl. I don't really get it. Like, why do you need to smile at all? Like, why do like a bare minimum smile, which makes you look like a sociopath when you could just not smile? Am I missing something? Do you understand why this would be happening? I guess you just have to be polite sometimes. Okay. Okay, I guess. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're just like... Politeness is a very foreign concept to me. It's not. I just don't think that like a fake <laughs> smile is like an especially polite thing, you know? Mm. But this one is like the slightest of ones. I'm being, I'm expending the least amount of energy possible to- I'm gonna try to do it. I'm gonna do it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're just using half, <laughs> half a face's worth of, uh, of muscles. <laughs> not to do it. I guess, uh, like, fine, right? Like, I guess, okay. It, we, know, we know that this character doesn't want to be involved in this conversation. So it's, we are learning something about the character through their behaviors as opposed to them being like, I wish I weren't talking to this girl. But I'm not, like, super compelled by this, but it's, I suppose, inoffensive. Uh, cool. Kylie, uh, Kaylee, thank you for sending that one in. Uh, also, general fiction, sweet nothing. Uh, here, the next one is uh, something from your world, uh, from Chris, uh, Kirsten. Sorry, Kristen. I'm sitting at the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller paperback trade fiction list, and no one knows it but me. Oh, congratulations, ghostwriter. Um, 
number one spot, uh, number one should be hyphenated because number one is an adjective describing the spot. Um, New York Times bestseller paperback trade fiction list. That's a mouthful. I think most readers would be just as satisfied with uh, with like number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Like I'm not sure that anyone but people in publishing or yeah, I don't think anyone cares that it's the paperback trade fiction list, right? I think this sentence is more effective with slightly less information. And so you can also get to that, like the impact of that, uh, of the last part of the phrase more quickly. So get rid of that paperback trade fiction thing. Yeah, I'm sitting at the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list and no one knows it but me. I always have to look up, whenever I encounter names of newspapers and stuff, I always have to look up what needs to be italicized. I think here just Times is italicized, but I could be totally wrong. So don't quote me on it. Just make sure that you're looking up the appropriate um, uh, italics and like sort of how we write out the names of newspapers. I never remember if like the cities Oop. are included in the italics or not. Yeah, I think I think the NYT may italicize their own one. People in the uh, in the comments should be able to tell us that. Yeah, it's something that I would be look. I would be consulting my Chicago Manual of Style if we had more time. I would probably do it, but you all right. can probably just Google it faster than I can. All right, I'm gonna get through just one more. One more. Uh, okay. Oh, one dear. more line. There's a, lot, there's a lot of pressure to sort of make this one. Uh, uh, here we go. I mean, uh, here's just a nice short one to finish on. The truth is, I tell lies all the time. Great. Get rid of the M dash and it's fine. You could put a comma after is. The truth is, I tell lies all the time. But like grammatically, you don't really need it. I could, you could take or leave the comma. I'm not gonna. We, yeah, okay. This is interesting. Is it YA? Uh, it is romance. But adult romance, huh? Uh, it's, well, I don't know, it's tough to tell. It's called Kisses, Lies, and Us. I feel like maybe adults don't really talk about kisses so, so very often. Yeah, I feel like that's like a little, but maybe they do, I don't know. Yeah, romance titles can be very twee, even for adults. It's part mm. of the conspiracy against acknowledging romance as a legitimate genre, but we won't have to talk about that today. All right, cool, well. <laughs> that brings us right to the end. Oh, my camera overheated uh, for a reason. Oh my that God. Know. That sounds dangerous. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, uh, Hi, uh, there you are. Uh, yeah, because uh, I think we, we went and shot something over the weekend in like glorious 4K. And so I was like broadcasting from it in 4K and I was like, oh, I just overheated it. Uh, great. Oh yeah, uh, someone's made a suggestion, Michael here. The truth is I bespeak uh, lies all the time. <laughs> Way to bring it home, Michael. Good job. <laughs> yeah, no, bespeak, bespeak, man. That was the that was the highlight today. Um, uh, uh, well, yeah. that, that was great. Thank you, thank you to everyone. There were some real lovely lines in there, and a lot of uh, what we will call learning opportunities. Oh, wonderful. Uh, well, Becca, before we log off, uh, can you tell the folks what you're up to, or what what uh, you can do for for them, perhaps through Reedsy? Okay. So you can find my profile on Readsy. You can find a lot of great profiles on Readsy. You can search by genre, um, language, all different keywords that you can use to find the editing and publishing professionals that can help you uh, publish your book. My specialty is developmental editing, which means I read your full manuscript and I deliver a hand annotated copy of that back to you along with a big long memo um, and little, I write you notes throughout the book. So, um, you know, that's what I love to do. You can check out my profile to find out what genres I prefer to work in. And I do hope you'll reach out, uh, if not to me, then to someone, because there's really like an incredible amount of talent on Readsy. And yeah, I just think there's probably the perfect collaborator on there waiting for every author. So yeah. Thanks great. So much. So if you haven't signed up for a Readsy account yet, they're free. Just uh, click the links in the uh, description there. 
Amazing. And no doubt Becca will have another one of these uh, before long. Uh, but yeah, you do these uh, on through your social media some of the times as well, right? I do. I actually try to post, I post a reel every day, almost every day uh, of a First Line Frenzy. And I have like a separate submission form that you can find through my Instagram profile so that if you uh, didn't see your line today, you may have a chance of seeing it on Instagram and you can join me over there. There's a really nice community of first line frenziers over there. I don't know. We need to, we need a name for the Legion, you know, yeah. like, like Swifties, but for first yeah. line frenzy. Yeah. It's like the Furies, but the frenzies, I don't know. We'll, we'll workshop yeah. it. Yeah, we're going to workshop that. We're going to, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in at home. Uh, if you're still getting this hit the like button on this, uh, maybe we'll get us some more views a little bit further down the line. Uh, everyone has really loved it. Susie, these sessions are recorded. Yep, they all are recorded. You can head to blog.breezy.com slash live. Uh, all of them from way back when are on there. Way back when. We've been doing this for years. So there's yeah, a lot. So, there's like a lot of content to enjoy. Like basically, <laughs> if you if you have like a, like a 14 hour flight, you could pretty much pack it straight back to back mainline the first line frenzies. Uh, I mean, one would assume you would have nightmares in my, like, with me narrating. But yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Well, uh, cool. everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Becca. Bye. Thank you, everyone.